you so much, Omar. Um, you've really talked me up, so I hope I can deliver for you now. <laughs> Um, my name is Michaela Jade. I started a company called In Digital uh, four years ago, and I'm here to, because I can share a little bit about having a bold idea that no one's ever done before and trying to actualize it. I guess that's why I'm able to stand here today um, at this great conference. Um, but first, I'd like to honour the Darawal people. They're my next door neighbours. Um, so I'm a Dadog woman, I'm a Kabrigal woman from the Dadog Nation and our boundary for the Dadawal people is the Georges River. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and future and acknowledge the continuing contribution that the Dadawal people make to the vibrancy of this great city of Wollongong. We've been here before, uh, the clash of the cultures so the oldest peoples in the world with the newest technologies. My ancestors were there last time it happened. And we've been talking about it for seven generations. So I wanted to wear my headdress today um, because it tells a little story about our people and when we're confronted with new cultures. Who knows about the kangaroo? <laughs> Yes, the legend of the kangaroo. Uh, so the kangaroo is one of our national emblems in Australia. Kangaroo, incidentally, means I don't understand you. <laughs> so <laughs> when Captain Cook and his friends came to Australia to start with, they asked our peoples, what is this animal? And we said, kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I don't understand you. And then they said, well, who are those people? And we said, Kuringai. And they, they said, OK, they must be the Kuringai people. And to us, that means those people from over there. So that was a misunderstanding that happened a little over 200 years ago that uh, perpetuates in today's society. And what I'm hoping with the work that I do is that we don't repeat those kind of mistakes in the technology sector. Imagine in the fast-paced world of technology, if we could understand each other without misinterpretation of what we're talking about, imagine what we could create together moving forward. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, why do Aboriginal people want to use technology? How are they going to use technology? And I've been saying to people lately, well, we've got opposable thumbs too. so. <laughs> We're actually quite good at technology. And by the way, we invented technology. We've been doing it since time began. So it seems easier to me to fit 100 years of digital technology culture into a culture that's been around since time began rather than trying to do it the other way around. So we don't end up here. And I was lucky enough to attend the United Nations last year. And I met a... Bokoda elder from the Panama Canal and we were talking about digital technology and he just went like this and I said what's wrong and he said they've taken our hardware our land and now they want our software too our knowledge that was a defining point for me I'm um, in the work that I do and I'd just like to share a little video that Questacon um, created this year when I was in Kakadu um, with you. So could I just play that now? Just go through about two minutes about the work that I've been doing just to give you some context. So what exactly is InDigital? InDigital is Indigenous and Digital and we create mobile phone apps that use augmented reality for Indigenous cultural storytelling. So we started with um, cultural storytelling on bark and ochre paintings and what we actually do with the app is you hold your phone up to the artwork and the artwork comes alive in three-dimensional storytelling. We use animation and the traditional owners who paint the artwork are very involved in how the artwork comes to life in 3D animation. It started because I'm a Cabrigal woman, so my country is actually not in Kakadu, it's in Sydney. Uh, I was standing at a cultural place of significance to our people and I didn't understand what the cultural site was about. And I really wanted a way to communicate what all these amazing cultural knowledge systems are about. And at the same time, I was at the University of Canberra and I saw augmented reality for the first time in 2012. And I went home and had a shower and then in the shower, this idea came into my head that we should try and combine augmented reality storytelling with Indigenous cultural knowledge systems. So augmented reality was very new in 2012 and it's still quite new to people. 
and explaining what my idea was was really, really difficult. Um, I was just making an assumption that everyone had seen augmented reality and they knew what I was talking about. Um, and I actually realised that I had a problem in the way I was communicating my big idea because I did the mum and dad test and my mum and dad just didn't really understand what I was doing. So I realised then that I needed to refine the way that I told um, people, investors, people who might want to get on board with the idea about what it is that I'm trying to achieve. And who is Indigital sort of aimed at? It's aimed at Indigenous communities, um, primarily in Australia, but could be applied across the world. So Indigenous peoples like myself, we have a lot of trouble engaging young people these days in cultural knowledge translation. And one thing that we found through talking to 300 elders from across the world was that traditional owners are proud custodians of humanity's spoken history but they're most afraid of being the last ones with these knowledge systems and they're finding it difficult to engage with young people. And I ask them why, because I'm an Indigenous person, I want to know my cultural heritage. And they said because the young people always have their heads in these devices and they can't compete with the phones and the iPads and digital technologies. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do was combine digital technologies and cultural heritage knowledge systems um, in the phone where the kids are. So we started with um, these cards in Kakadu, working with five senior traditional artists to tell stories from bark ochre paintings, which are very traditional. So they're like the artwork you've seen at the cave here. They were painted on bark and we brought them to life in 3D augmented reality. And now that the community is very comfortable with what the technology is, they're happy to move to sites like this. So the next phase of in digital storytelling is making the app um, available to tourists that might come to our cultural places. So they can hold their phone up to a site like this and the, the artwork will come to life for them in their language so they understand what they're looking at. And the reason that that's really important to traditional owners here is that it gives them an economic development opportunity. And traditional owners, um, they've been explaining to me that they're not always available to be on country. So it's a really great way for them to be able to share their stories in the way that they want to be told. Um, and also be able to earn an income from their cultural knowledge. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so a couple of you um, have those cards and I was just hoping that you could download the Indigital Storytelling app from whatever platform you're on and just point your phone over it and have a little share of those cards. You have some thinking music, Omar. We do some interpretive dance or something. <laughs> the reason I'm asking you to do this is after four years of this project, I've just discovered it's easier if people just have a go themselves so they can understand what I'm talking about because it is one of those phenomenally difficult ideas to get your head around. Have you guys found it? <laughs> Don't forget to say yes to allow the camera um, to connect to the app. Yes? Yep. Yep, totally. So, oh, I can hear someone's onto it already. <laughs> okay, if you move it around, you'll see it's fully dynamic. So, it'll follow the card wherever you put it, including different ways. So, you can flip it horizontally or vertically. Lay it flat and you'll see the 3D. Um, yep, leave your phone up and leave it flat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, listen to all those broggers. Yes. Okay, yep. So I will go through how we did this. I just want people to see it so they can, what I'm saying makes sense.
It's a little bit different. <laughs> Nothing like a demo, especially when you're trying to explain the impossible. <laughs> Okay, if you guys haven't had an opportunity to have a look, I'll get you to hijack one of these people with a card um, afterwards. So, there's a lot of stuff that wasn't explained about bringing an idea like this to life in that little video. <laughs> so, how it did start was, I, I'm a Cabrigal woman, obviously I told you that. Um, I was out on country and I saw our Madiong dreaming. So, these are the feathers of the emu, our Madiong. And we're petroglyphic people, so we carve into the rock. And I was standing there going, wow, that's beautiful. I don't know what it means. I don't know who can tell me who what it, mean, what it means. So how are other people supposed to understand our culture? And around the same time, I was doing some work at the University of Canberra. And they were experimenting with really basic augmented reality. Um, and I did go home and have a shower and this idea popped into my head like, whoa, imagine we could do this with our cultural stories we could share not only our culture intergenerationally between young and old people, we could share it with other people that aren't from our culture. We could share it internationally, we could share it in their language. It would be amazing. Um, but the problem was it was 2012 and Pokemon Go hadn't been invented and <laughs> the technology wasn't ready for my idea. Um, so I did manage to find someone who wanted to do a basic prototype with me um, and we found the limitations were quite extensive. So it could only occur when you had connection to the internet, which was going to be a major problem for my vision because a lot of our cultural knowledge uh, is not in an internet serviced area. <laughs> so we applied for a grant to prototype and see if we could break this tech. And I got a quarter of the money that I needed. I got a really tiny grant, it was like 25 grand. Um, to try and make this technology come alive, which was basically impossible. Um, and I went out to two tender processes in Australia and nobody would work with me. They said, uh -huh, Indigenous people don't use technology, um, that's crazy, it'll never work without the internet. Um, what it, why are Aboriginal people wanting to do this? Um, I had a lot of um, criticism about the idea. So I do what... Most women do when people say no and I went home and cried on my bed for a long time. <laughs> and then I pulled myself together and I said, this is not going to be my legacy. I don't want to hand this grant money back. Um, so at nine o'clock at night, I decided to cold call the entire world and I Google searched augmented reality and augmented reality builders and I spoke to a lot of people. A lot of people didn't understand me. Um, I had the worst pitch in the world. I said, hey, I'm a girl from Australia. Um, I want to build this app and I've only got 25,000. Um, will you work with me? And most people uh, didn't return my call or said, how much money did you say? Ha, ha, ha. Um, so I eventually found someone though and my knight in shining armour uh, codes in a barn in Biggles Wade in the back of the UK and we started working together online at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, we worked together through Skype for 18 months to work out how we could make this app work, um, which involved a lot of running down to the site, testing, doing photogrammetry, experimenting with four-dimensional photogrammetry, printing out 3D models of the site and seeing if they could trigger it back in the UK. Um, and then one morning, the app works and the traditional owner comes to life. At, in front of my eyes from this site and it was like the best day ever. I don't know if you guys have been working on something for a really long time and then it finally falls into place but wow, there's nothing like it. Yeah, I think um, it's part of the addiction of being an entrepreneur, I think, <laughs> for moments like that. Um, so that was fantastic and I was so excited and the possibilities just opened right up from there. However, um, my partner was offered a job to be part manager of Kakadu um, right around that time. So I said, wow, that's an amazing opportunity for you. Uh, okay, let's do it. So we moved to Kakadu, um, which was quite terrifying for me because it was moving to a place that didn't have internet, um, which seemed to set me back quite a bit in my journey <laughs> making this app. Um, so one thing I learned about going to Kakadu and building a technology platform um, like the app that you've just used 
is that it takes a long time to move into a community where you don't know anybody. And it takes a really, really, really long time to move into an Aboriginal community where nobody has kind of heard about this technology before. You're a newcomer. Um, people come and go to places like Kakadu all the time and make promises to people and, um, and then leave. So the traditional owners were sort of interested in doing it, but what they wanted to do first was do a lot of walking on country and going camping and hunting and just talking about stuff, um, which was really great. But I'm like, yeah, OK, can we talk about this app now? <laughs> this is the idea. And um, it wasn't until eight months later they said, hey, you, when you first got here, you were talking about this ting. <laughs> they call it a ting. And I was like, oh, ting is that? You know, the ting on this, the, the phone. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that ting. Yeah, OK. So I just kind of left it there and I said, what do you guys reckon? Um, see what it does. So I printed out a marker for them and it was like a real estate augmented reality app. It had nothing to do with culture. And they used it and like, why? This is Ballander magic. <laughs> um, Ballander's white people. And I said, I'm not Ballander. <laughs> this is Caprigal magic. So we ended up um, discussing heavily with the community about where, where they wanted to do it and what they wanted to do um, with the app. And because it was so new, they weren't willing to try it on 60,000-year-old sites. Fair enough. So we sort of had a little brainstorm and thought, where else can we do it? And they said, well, what about we just do the paintings on the artwork but we paint them on bark? And I said, oh, that's perfect. Do you think it'll work on bark? I don't know. Let's try. <laughs> so we did the paintings and... Um, then we had to work out how are we going to share this in 3D augmented reality? Like, how, what's it going to look like? And that we traditionally, when you're doing animation, like I've never built any animation before, so I was fiercely googling how do you make an animation? Um, and then it was like, oh, you start with a storyboard. So I started this storyboarding methodology with traditional owners. And at this point, I'll mention that English is their third language. So trying to explain what a storyboard is in English, trying to get it into Konjakmi and Kunwinku uh, was really hard. At this time, um, my development team I'd built out from India, so they speak Hindi. So <laughs> we were trying, I was kind of the bridge between this mishmash of cultures trying to work together on this basic thing called a storyboard. And one of the elders, um, Neville Namanyuk, who's the most amazing guy, and when I say elders, these guys are 45, right? The life expectancy in Kakadu for a man is 47. So they are really the elders of the community. Um, he said, well, can't you just film me doing the dance and then do the animation from that? And I was like, that's a great idea. Let's try. <laughs> so we literally did a film on an iPhone, him doing his cultural dance. Um, and then we put it back to my animation team in India and said, hey, do you, can you try and do something with this? <laughs> um, so they did. And it was really funny because when he, he filmed the dance and we had the painting of Namande, which I can show you later with, through my business card, he's like a spirit figure and he has these huge testicles between his legs. And he also has like a cloth on to cover his private parts, a traditional way. And when I got the animation back from my team in India, he had big testicles, but he also had a massive penis. <laughs> so I, was like, I showed it to Trishul owner and they said, oh, no, 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 no. So we had to go back and iterate how we did the animation because, um, yeah, while that was funny, it was kind of culturally inappropriate as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we started working on this method where we started filming the guys doing the movements and then we started filming the, um, recording the guys in a really basic recording studio which was a shipping container. It wasn't anything like we'd have here um, to get the audio and the story together. So they, they were just so proud of the work that we did and they started calling it Kakadu Disney. And they're like, we want to do more Kakadu Disney. Um, so... I'd love to do more work up there and I'm working on a, a rock art site now, um, which rock art is really... So we did the stuff with the barks, which worked really well. So we got the app to work without the internet. You can play that augmented reality on the moon if you want to um, using that picture. So the barrier of no internet's gone now. Um, so we decided to work on another site. So the first site was in Canberra. It was a four-tonne rock. Um, we got to work. Um, now we're doing a 
huge, huge cave in Kakadu at a site called Nolanji, which has the lightning man dreaming. And it's such a fascinating story. When I first went to Kakadu and heard about lightning man Namagon, I was like, wow, i got to do this guy. He's so cool. So there's six seasons in Kakadu and when the lightning season comes through, that's when Namagon comes. And Namagon's this cool figure. He's kind of like, sits like this and he's got axes on his elbows and on his knees. And he goes through the landscape going... (laughs) ..crashing all the trees down with his axes, which is the lightning. So he's actually, his story is to tell Binning to move to higher ground because the wet season's coming. That's why Namagon's on the rock. So we're, we're animating Namagon with a senior traditional owner called Jeffrey Lee, who incidentally um, stopped uh, Kungara uranium mine um, a couple of years ago. So he's a really incredible guy. He's got an order of Australia. He's just, he's such a cool guy to, um, to know and work with. Um, Yeah, so doing the site was a little bit harder. Um, I couldn't do 4D photogrammetry in the way that we'd done with um, Canberra because of the site. It's just so – like, it's really, really big. It's probably twice the size of this um, room high and it's just covered in artwork. But you can imagine the application for augmented reality to a site like that. You will be able to put your phone on Namagon and he will come alive in 3D animation. He will tell the lightning man story in any language. Um, But also, some of the figures that are around him are starting to decay through erosion, through termites, through buffalo getting in there and rubbing their kind of backs on the rock art. So what we can actually do with augmented reality is we can put the pictures back digitally. So when you put the phone back up there, the the artworks as they were and as they've been recorded in the 60s can come back alive in the way that they were. Um, So this is really interesting because people are starting to look at how can we use this for climate change and climate change related work, which is something that I'd never designed um, in the start. So all these things kind of come out as you start building building new ideas. But because the site was so big, um, we had to look at other ways to kind of make 4D photogrammetry. So I'm a bit of a geek and thought, oh, what about drones? Maybe that would work. (laughs) Um, So I ended up Um, working with Kakadu National Park and training up four Indigenous commercial drone pilots so we could start recording these sites in 4D photogrammetry. It's really, really, really high resolution 4D recordings of these cultural places. But what we use them for is to build point clouds from. So we have 1,500 points of recognition for this site. So, I'm, you know, the 4D photogrammetry is a byproduct of my process, but it's really useful for those guys for recording their cultural knowledge. But the, the point clouds now enable us to um, use the image recognition technology on the points of the rock art to, to trigger those stories. So, basically, what the app's doing is when it sees those points all line up, it goes, ah, oh, that's Namagon, I'm going to bring that data from that data set and we're going to bring in this um, narrative. If your phone is in German, it will come up in German. So it automatically recognises languages. Um, So that's how it... That was kind of the kakadu phase. When I was building an app, there's a couple of things that you need to think about. Obviously, it's cultural law and cultural law is is such a huge part of all our cultures. Um, being respectful of cultural law is really, really important for um, working with digital technologies. And a couple of questions came up that I just couldn't answer um, when I was building this. So I started freaking out because I realised we were creating all these incredible stories and curating these knowledge systems from the beginning of time. Where were we going to put them all? (laughs) Um, And so I had to look at... What data is my app collecting on and through people? Because you have data about data too. Um, So what do we do with the metadata? Who owns that data? Where does that data live? And how do these people get access to their data systems? And these questions just got bigger and bigger and bigger. um, Until... And I started talking about them publicly and that attracted the attention of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Um, So in 2014... I was invited to go to New York and put an intervention around the ethical digitalisation of Indigenous knowledge systems. Um, Tomorrow, incidentally, is the United Nations Day, um, International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. 
So it's a day where we celebrate the world's Indigenous peoples. There's 360 million of us around the world. Um, and it's also the 10-year anniversary of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which means it was adopted in 2007, which means what? <laughs> Yeah, 10 years, but it also means no one had a smartphone in their hand when this document was adopted. So n there's no digital anything in there protecting our rights as Indigenous peoples over our knowledge systems in a digital environment. So we raised this in 2014 and again in 2015 um, and with the support of the United Nations Development Program, we also ran workshops um, not only in New York but in Darwin and Hawaii and New Zealand, um, sharing Indigenous technology stories um, and experiences. And what I discovered um, from this group of incredible people that came forward is that there's what's called Jugard innovation happening all over the world in Indigenous communities. So have you guys come across Jugard in innovation? There's such a cool book called Jugard Innovation. And basically it's, um, it's an Indian term. And it comes from the innovation that happens frugally, flexibly and inclusively. And some of the world's biggest corporations are onto this, right? So if you go into communities like the community I lived in, Kakadu, they don't have a lot of anything. But what they do have, they use really well and they use really innovatively. So they can make things happen that we can't even dream of. Like there's guys up in Arnhem that have built their own Wi-Fi tower to get reception from Timor. There's guys that are melting down ghost nets in Arnhem and making extrusion plastics and doing 3D printing for things that they need in their community. Like there's a lot of really cool innovation happening with little money um, but lots of flexibility and lots of inclusivity of the community. Anyway, I found out that there's a group of people like me, um, Indigenous people around the world, doing really cool stuff with really cutting-edge technology. Um, so some of them are Tashka Yawanawa. So he's from the Yawanawa people in the Amazon. Um, his people were only had first contact in 1987. So up until 1987, the rest of the world kind of didn't exist to them and they didn't exist to the rest of the world. Um, Interestingly, his father, who was the chief of the Awanawas people at the time, sent his son Tashka into the city to study computer technology. How cool is that and what foresight <laughs> about what was coming? Um, so Tashka now is working on this really cool, complex 3D um, virtual reality story, telling the story of the Yawanawas and what, what it's like to be first contact peoples. So that'll be coming out next year, which will be really, really cool. Um, there's a guy called Atama Katama and he's a Dayak man from the Borneo. They're building their own drones to do remote sensing of their forest areas to protect their forests from illegal forestry. They've built their own platforms like out of stuff around the community. It's really cool. Um, there's a girl called Lin Lin Su. She's a Taiwanese woman. Um, she's a lot younger than me. She's just in her early 20s. Um, she's using traditional knowledge systems like in most of us have traditional knowledge systems around um, sudden impact stuff like earthquakes or tsunamis and things. You can, there's keys in nature that tell us that these things are happening. So she's curating all that information and she's made it into an early warning system for tsunamis, earthquakes, all sorts of natural disasters in her community that can release this information quickly through mobile networks so people are alerted before they happen. Um, there's, type, uh, there's Ghazali Orella, who's a human rights lawyer in the UN and he's helping us pull together a piece around the ethical digitalisation of um, culture because he's been um, exiled from his own indigenous lands in the Philippines. Like He can never go back there. So he works in the UN um, working on what he can do to help the rest of us deal with this, um, this impact of technology. Um, there's Myron Dewey, who he's been at Standing Rock since the whole um, Dakota Pipeline thing started. And he's been um, working with Stingray technology. So Stingray technology is like, it's described as an un unconstitutional all-you-can-eat data buffet. So <laughs> there's a little box, um, basically intercepts all kinds of data from people's mobile phones. And um, he's 
he's been researching the impact of this stingray technology on how the government is prosecuting Indigenous peoples for protesting against the pipeline. Um, there's Andy Abdilla who's um, in Sydney. She's working on artificial intelligence algorithms and she's looking at how do you put cultural knowledge systems into AI so artificial intelligence doesn't have a cultural bias. Um, and there's me working on XR, which is AR slash VR, and um, dabbling in blockchain as well. So together we've come, we've come together um, to really elevate this whole issue around the ethical digitalization of our cultural knowledge systems and and change how we might understand data better and data as money and data as money opportunities to um, increase our economic development opportunities from our cultural knowledge. Um, so that's a little bit about my story, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's been a really interesting experience. Personally, it's, there's been lots of highs and lows, like there is with everybody's company. Um, attracting investment has been incredibly difficult. Um, I had one. In, well, I think the problem is with investment, and this is my personal opinion: is most investors in Australia are uh, male. They're not indigenous, and they don't live in operate in remote communities, and they're often not involved in cutting edge tech. So it's really, really hard as a woman who fits all those diversity criteria to appeal to people who just haven't had a lived experience of what I'm talking about and what I'm trying to solve. Um, so hence the reason why I get people to see it now because I just love that 90 seconds where people see what we've created and gone, oh, that's amazing. And they see the possibility and the potential. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you.